I walked to 7-Eleven right before they closed. I needed to buy cigarettes. The place was empty except for a teenage girl who was behind the cash register. She smiled at me, but I could tell she was annoyed that she had to serve one last customer while she was already in the process of closing up. I asked for a pack and gave her my money. I thanked her and turned around to leave when an old man walked in. He was extremely short and thin, and he wore an eye patch. The cashier said, I'm sorry, sir, but we're closed. It had just turned 11. For a second, it looked like the man was about to turn around and leave. But instead, he marched toward the counter and screamed at the cashier. As he pointed at me, he said, You just served him. Is he better than me? It Despite his small size, the man seemed dangerous. I wanted to get out of there before things escalated, but the poor girl behind the counter looked so young and afraid. I didn't want to leave her alone with the man. So, I remained standing by the door waiting to see if he would calm down and leave. Rather than put up a fight, the cashier took back what she told him and asked him what he wanted to buy. It's too late for that. He screamed at her. Then, like a wild animal, he jumped over the counter and lunged at the girl. I couldn't see what happened next because they both disappeared behind the counter. But I could hear their fight continue. It sounded like he was clawing at her while she tried to push him off. I had to act fast. I ran around the side of the counter, but when I reached them, the fight was already over. The girl slowly stood up while the man stayed motionless on the ground. He was dead. A vape pen was sticking out of the side of his neck. You killed him, I said. The girl didn't respond. She must have been in shock. I pulled out my phone and called 911. Then I led the girl outside and we sat together on the sidewalk before the police arrived. When two cop cars finally drove in, the girl's shock must have dissipated. She told them everything that had happened. I vouched for everything she said, making sure that they knew it was all in self-defense. One of the policemen took the girl back to the station so she could give her full statements and probably get some medical attention. Another cop told me I was free to go, and then went inside the 7-Eleven to look over the crime scene. I started walking back home. I only lived five minutes away, and I never had any problems walking around at night. But I really wished that the police had offered to drop me off. I didn't want to be alone right now, especially after everything I'd just seen. I stayed on the main road. Just one car drove past. Otherwise, everything was motionless and silent. Right before I turned onto my street, I heard footsteps behind me. I turned around, but didn't see anyone. I started walking faster, and those footsteps sped up too. I started running down the street as fast as I could. When I reached the front door, I pulled out my keys. Before I could even open the door though, someone tapped me on the shoulder. I spun around and saw the man with the eye patch. His clothes were covered in blood and the vape pen was still sticking out of his neck, but he was alive. He found me all the way back home. You need medical help, I told him. Let me call an ambulance. You let me die, he whispered. But you're not dead. You let me die, he said again. His expression was twisted in rage. It seemed like he blamed me for what happened to him. I tried to reason with him, to tell him that if he let me go outside, I'd call an ambulance and get him help. But he wasn't listening. Instead, he kept repeating the same thing over and over. You let me die. My house key was already in the door. Still facing him, I reached behind my back and tried to unlock the door without him seeing. I heard the familiar click noise, realizing that my door was unlocked. Then, as fast as I could, I twisted the knob ran inside and slammed the door behind me. It wouldn't close. The man's foot was in the way. He pushed his way in. Even though he was small and very wounded, he had enough strength to knock me to the ground. He crouched over me, one hand squeezing into my neck. Blood from his face was dripping on me. Some even got in my mouth. I tried to twist to the side, but he used his free hand to punch me in the stomach. 
I gasped for air. Please, I struggled to say. I just wanted cigarettes. He glared at me for a long moment. I thought he was getting ready to kill me. But then he let go of my throat and stood up. Slowly, I stood up too. We were face to face in the living room. I had no idea what he wanted me to do. Then he reached forward, waiting for me to give him something. It took me a while to figure out what he was doing. Then I pulled my new pack of cigarettes out of my pocket and handed it to him. He nodded in approval. Then, without saying a word, he walked away. I locked my door and called the police again. When they pulled into my street, they found the man lying dead on the ground. It took them three minutes to get there, but by the time they did, the man had smoked his last cigarette. The stub was still between his fingers. I guess having one last smoke was the only thing keeping him alive. Since then, I've given up smoking completely. Best decision of my life. I still get craving sometimes, but whenever I do, I just think about the man with the eye patch. For as long as I can remember, my parents would go on a weekend getaway about every three months or so. I used to hate them because they would make me stay with my grandparents, but all that changed when I turned 16. They decided since I could drive, they could leave me alone for the weekend. They would always leave me some cash for food and the house would be mine. I know most teenagers would take that kind of opportunity to throw a party, but I was never part of the cool popular crowd. I was one of the weird kids in the robotics club who had bad acne. It was okay though, because my buddy Trevor and I devised our own ritual for these weekends. We would get stoned out of our minds and watch movies. My parents always left me 50 bucks for food. I used this to buy brownies from a sketchy kid at school. The rest we used to make sure we had good snacks for when the munchies hit later. Trevor would order and pay for the pizza as his contribution. Sometimes, the brownies were potent and we couldn't move for hours. Other times, they were duds and we hardly felt a thing. It was a fun Russian roulette situation. I miss those nights. We would eat too much and laugh at things that weren't funny, but I guess all good things must come to an end. Our last weekend doing this started like all the others. My parents left right when they got off work and left me the money and a note on the table. Trevor came over when he finished his shift at the grocery store. We were pretty stoked for this weekend because Trevor was able to score us some flour that we planned to smoke in his car. Even if the brownies were duds, we'd still be high. Trevor knocked on my door with some chips in hand, and we planned the night out. We would consume the brownies right away because they can take an hour or so to hit, and in the meantime, we would get high by hotboxing his car. I suggested we order the pizza before we went out and hotboxed, so it would arrive right when we finished the We timed it perfectly. As I inhaled, it scorched my throat and lungs and I started coughing. Trevor giggled and told me that's how you know it'll work. He was right. After that first hit, I felt my eyes grow heavier and my mouth drier. I felt like Mac Miller was holding me in his arms, rocking me to the beat. I told Trevor this and he said, dude, what? And started laughing uncontrollably. What do you feel? I asked. Trevor was still laughing. He smoked with his co-workers a lot, so he was enjoying watching me smoke for the first time. Good, man. I feel good. He continued to laugh. After the pizza man dropped our pizza at the door, we stepped out of the car along with a cloud of smoke. Trevor and I looked at each other and laughed. We scurried back up to my house grabbed the pizza, and were in for the night. What do you want to watch? I asked Trevor. Uh, let's just scroll through Netflix until we find something. We scrolled through Netflix for about an hour before landing on something to watch. We kept getting distracted or would kind of blank out going through the movies. Dude, our pizza's getting cold. We just gotta pick something. Trevor said. We landed on Pineapple Express. The movie started playing and Seth Rogen and James Franco went back and forth on the screen. As the two argued, I felt my brownie grow heavier. Trevor, when did we take the brownies? Trevor checked his phone. 
Like an hour and a half ago. Do you feel it? I don't know. He responded. I feel it. I started to laugh. I became transfixed by the movie, and the bites of pizza melted in my mouth. I'm not sure how much time passed, but I looked over at Trevor, and he was passed out on the couch with his plate of pizza on his chest. With his mouth open, he snored lightly. I took a picture. I looked back at the TV, and Seth Rogen looked at me. I laughed. Oh, whoa. Hey, man. Hey. Seth responded. I sat up. Hey, man. You need to check out your basement. What? I asked. There's a man down there. A squatter. You need to check it out. Is this real? Seth laughed. <laughs> I don't know, man, but I know you need to check your basement. I woke Trevor up and looked back at the screen. The movie was playing like normal. I explained to him what happened. He said he never heard of someone having a hallucination from weed. I shrugged and convinced him to check out the basement with me. My parents and I never used our basement. It's unfinished, so we used it as storage for everything we refused to get rid of because we might need it one day. I usually avoid it at all cost. It just has bad vibes. We stood at the top of the stairs and looked down into the black abyss. Trevor motioned for me to go first. I used my phone as a flashlight until I reached the one light bulb hanging from the ceiling. It was a maze of boxes and dust. We started to make our way around the boxes when we heard a scrapping noise. What the hell? Trevor said. I had no clue what would be making that noise. Maybe the windows open? Trevor rounded a corner and immediately backed up. His face was pale, like he had seen a ghost. In the quietest whisper, he said, There's a man. I shoved him behind me so I could look, and he wasn't playing around. In the back corner, nestled between our Christmas and Halloween decoration boxes, was a man who looked about 50 with a long braided beard and no shoes. His feet were so calloused, I guess he didn't need shoes. I turned back to Trevor. He has a machete! Somehow, the man didn't hear us, so we crept back upstairs to get a baseball bat. Trevor called the cops, and they said they would be there as soon as possible. I don't know what compelled me to go back down. It filled me with courage or something. I grabbed my metal baseball bat and descended back down the stairs despite Trevor's protest. I walked to where the man was and confronted him. Hey! The man looked up at me and grunted. His eyes were wide and bloodshot. What are you doing here? He grunted at me again. He stood up and picked up his machete. What do you want? The man grunted and pointed his machete at me, and with his other hand, used the thumb to trace a sharp line across his throat. He was going to kill me. At this moment, all the courage left my body, and I ran back up the stairs. The man grunted and chased me. He almost got me, but I made it up the stairs and slammed the door in his face. Trevor had to help me hold the door shut. The squatter was surprisingly strong for someone who looked like they hadn't seen the sun in months. Sirens and red and blue lights filled my house. The cops arrived. We had to yell for them to come in because we couldn't abandon the door since the squatter was still trying to push it open. The cops came in and saw what was happening. They lifted their guns towards us and motioned for us to step away. We listened. And the man came rushing out of the door with a crazed look in his eyes. The cops had no choice but to shoot him down. After the cops took our statement and someone took away the body, we went back down to the basement. The squatter's corner was rancid. The man had created an entire camp down there. He used a Halloween jack-o'-lantern as a toilet, and there were dozens of empty bean cans. It looked like he had been there for months. My parents were furious to hear I was getting high when they went out of town, so I was no longer allowed to stay in the house alone for a weekend. I'll never know if the squatter planned to come out of the basement to kill me, but I still think Seth Rogen and the Brownie saved my life. Yes, delivering for Amazon was horrible. It's long hours with impossible deadlines. It's stressful, and management comes down on you hard when you don't meet their absurd standards. My friends and family saw how much it drained me and tried to convince me to get another job, but I never listened. I needed the money, and it was hard to find a job at that time. 
I did end up leaving, but not for the reasons most do. The day started like any other. It was an early start, 6 a.m. So I chugged my coffee on the way to the warehouse as the sun rose from the horizon. They gave me my shipments for the day, and I knew it was going to be a long one. I got the route that went into the more rural areas, which I hated. You get fewer packages and stops, but there is a greater distance between each delivery, so you end up driving more. I filled up my coffee cup and my water bottle and hit the road. I started in a suburb, so it was easy. Many dogs barked at me, a few apartments with hidden front doors I had to hunt for, so it was a usual morning. I started getting to the packages that took me out to the boonies, and the drive between each stop grew longer and longer. I made a playlist full of old school rock that helped me though. The route took me deep into the woods, which led me to the house. There were tall black metal gates in front of the driveway, with cobwebs gathered in the metal design. I rang the doorbell, and the gates creaked open. I couldn't see the house from the bottom of the hill. It was hidden in the tall trees. The driveway took me up to a dark mansion that looked like it housed the Adams family. Crows congregated in the front yard, along with a large black mastiff chained to a post. The dog wasn't distracted by the crows. He kept his eyes on me. This house had multiple large packages, so it took a couple of trips to get them all out on the front porch. The dog growled at me each time I went up to the door to drop a package. Once all the boxes were in place, I went to ring the doorbell, but I couldn't find one. Instead, I used a demonic looking lion holding a metal ring in its mouth. I knocked three times and turned to leave. I hopped back in my van and got out of there as quickly as possible. The gate slowly opened to let me go, but I didn't make it far when my tire blew. I checked my phone to call for help, but there was no service. My next stop was 15 miles away, and the creepy house wasn't even a mile in the other direction felt like my only option was to go back up to that creepy mansion to see if I could get service or use their phone to call Amazon or someone to help. I made my way back to the house. The gate swung open and I squeezed through once I was big enough for a person to fit through. I approached the black double doors and lifted the ring in the lion's mouth. Before I was able to slam it down, the door opened. A tall, broad man stood before me. Can I help you? He asked in a deep voice. Yeah, sorry to bother you. My tire just blew, and I need to call someone at my work so they can dispatch someone to help. Do you have a phone I could use? Mine has no service. The man took a deep sigh. Yes, come in. The inside was dark and musty. The big man told me he needed to look for his phone and we'd be back in a moment. He instructed me to stay in the foyer. He wasn't gone long when a woman peered around the corner. She must have been the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. She had blue doe eyes and long brown hair. Who are you? Her voice was as delicate as she looked. I'm Marcus. My car broke down. Poor boy. She came up to me and caressed my chest. Can I give you a tour? My heart began to race. Her blue eyes gazed into mine, and I couldn't think of an answer. Her hand traced my chest, down my arm to my hand, and she led me to the stairs. Come in. You know, that big guy, I assume your husband, told me to wait in the foyer. He'll forgive you. She led me up the stairs. I kept looking back to see if her husband was back with the phone. The beautiful woman took me down the hall into a lavish bedroom. You know, I'm really just here to call for- Shh. Things were finally happening for me, but suddenly, the big man appeared in the doorway, enraged at what he saw. He stormed over to the bed and ripped his wife off of me. I put my hands up in defense. I promise, man, she came onto me. I wanted to wait in the foyer for you. He grabbed me by my arm and led me out of the room. His wife followed, giggling the whole time. I assured him I had no interest in his wife and just wanted to use a phone to get the hell out of there. He gripped my arm tighter and dragged me down the stairs and around the corner into a dark room. He turned the lights on, and it looked like a torture chamber. All sorts of weapons hung from the wall. He slammed me down on the table that was in the middle of the room and began to fasten my arms and legs so I couldn't escape. Listen, I really don't want any trouble. I just need help changing my tire. He continued like he didn't hear what I was saying. 
His wife floated around the table like a devious fairy, still giggling. I began to try and get out of the arm cuffs. The man was in such a rush to tie me down, he didn't do it very tightly. He rolled up a cart of knives and scissors next to the table and told his wife to take off my pants, and she obeyed. To seduce another man's wife is an abomination that deserves punishment. The man spoke. He picked up a large pair of shears. The price is your manhood. His wife's giggles turned into sharp laughter. I watched as he drew the shears closer to my manhood, and right before he was close enough to clasp it, my hand broke free and I slapped him. It wasn't that powerful of a slap, but it caught him off guard enough that he stumbled back. I grabbed one of the knives on his table, and as he came back to handle me, I stabbed his arm. He recoiled long enough I was able to take off my leg cuffs, grab my pants, and ran out. His wife wasn't laughing anymore and tried to block me at the door. I pushed her aside and ran for my life. I ran down their long driveway. I could hear their dogs barking fade with each sprint. Once I reached the gate, I put my pants on and squeezed myself through the metal bars. I hitchhiked back to the warehouse, and when I told my supervisor what happened, he didn't believe me. So he fired me on the spot for losing a van with packages. Honestly, I wasn't even upset because I planned to quit after that trauma. I worked at the same insurance company for five years. It wasn't a perfect job, but I didn't have any problems. I liked my coworkers and never had to take my work home with me. Unfortunately, everything changed about a month ago when our supervisor retired. He'd hired his nephew Mark as a replacement, and Mark was absolutely terrible. He was in his early 20s and had no idea what he was doing. He tried to make all these changes that just caused more work and more confusion for me and my coworkers. He introduced a new online platform that we had to use, which meant that we basically had to enter all the information twice. A task that should have taken 15 minutes to complete ended up taking over an hour. And slowly, I started working overtime without getting paid for it. Normally, I took the files home with me and did the extra work on my home computer. But last weekend, the electricity at my house went out and I had to go back to the office to finish everything before Monday. It was about 10 at night and the whole building was completely empty. We should have had a security guard outside the building, but I didn't see him when I walked in. I sat at my desk and started finishing off my work. I thought it would take me an hour, but I ended up staying there until about midnight before I finally finished everything. I printed out all the copies I needed and was putting them back in their folders when I heard the door open. Because I was going through the drawers, I was crouched on the ground and didn't see who had entered. I peered over my cubicle wall and saw Mark walk in with a woman. He had his arms around her shoulder and they were talking and laughing. The woman wore an extremely short red dress and had thick, trashy makeup. She looked like you know what. I was so shocked and embarrassed to see the two of them together that I stayed crouched on the ground so that they wouldn't see me. I figured it would be best if I stayed hidden until they went into his office. I knew that I just found out Mark's secret and could use this information to my advantage. But I wasn't that kind of person. Even if Mark made my life miserable, I would never blackmail him over it. I stayed there for about five minutes as Mark led this woman through the office and gave her a tour of the place. The way he talked to her made it seem like he was some big shot instead of the manager of a tiny insurance company. All the woman said were things like, wow, and that's incredible. Then I heard a door close and their voices faded away. He had taken her into his office. This was my opportunity to sneak out of there before he saw me. Crouching low to the ground, I crept back toward the exit. I had to walk past his office door on my way, which meant that I heard their voices on the other side of the wall. I reached for the handle to the front door and tried to open it without making a sound, when I heard a scream coming from Mark's office. It was a scream of pain. I froze in place, my hand still on the doorknob, as I heard Mark angrily shout, Shut up! <laughs> then, there was a loud thud and the woman screaming stopped. After that, there was only silence. 
couldn't see what happened, thank God, but it definitely sounded like Mark had gotten violent with that woman. It sounded like he'd killed her. Mark's office door slowly creaked open. I realized that I didn't have enough time to get out of the building without Mark seeing me. So, I flattened myself onto the floor and crawled behind one of the cubicles. I peered around the edge of the cubicle as Mark walked backward out of his office. He was dragging the woman's body toward the exit. She was definitely dead. As he dragged her, he kept muttering under his voice. It was an accident, he said. It's not my fault. I held my breath so that he wouldn't hear me. Mark slowly opened the front door and started dragging that poor woman into the lobby. Once they were gone, I was finally able to breathe again. I gasped in air, but it was too soon because Mark instantly ran back inside and shouted, Who's there? He knew that I was hiding somewhere. I could hear his footsteps pound through the office, looking around each of the cubicles. It was only a matter of time before he found me. I had to act fast. Just as he walked toward my hiding place, I jumped up and shoved the water cooler onto its side. Water splashed everywhere. It didn't hurt Mark, but it distracted him long enough to run past him and out the door. I had to step over that woman's body before I reached the front of the building. My hands shaking, I pulled my ID card out of my pocket. I needed to scan it before the door would open. Mark ran toward me, not saying a word. He grabbed me just as I got the doors to open. I twisted out of his grip and raced into the parking lot. I knew he'd catch me before I could get inside my car, so I ran right past him. I had to get to the main road. Even in the middle of the night, there were always cars on the road. Mark would never be able to stop me with so many witnesses driving by. I skidded to a stop when I reached the sidewalk. With a huge stroke of luck, a police car was driving by at that exact moment. I waved my arms in the air to get its attention, and the car made a U-turn and came back for me. I looked over my shoulder, but Mark was no longer there. He'd given up on the chase. I told the policeman that i just witnessed a murder. He called in backup and then followed me back toward the office. When we went back inside, Mark was gone. So was the body. All that was left was a streak of blood running across the floor. Work has been canceled since this all happened. The police are still looking for Mark, but I'm pretty sure they'll find him. He doesn't seem smart enough to stay hidden for long. Still don't know why he killed that poor woman. I just hope that I never have to see him again. I don't know how long the man slowly crept towards my home. I checked the ring doorbell footage as far back as it would let me go, and every Monday and Thursday, he would be there, slowly getting closer and closer to the door. Each night he walked outside, he took a step closer until he was on my porch. He never wore anything distinct that could give me some idea of who he was. Every time he appeared, he was dressed in all black with his hood up. When he got close enough to the door that the camera could capture his face, he started wearing a black face mask like a burglar. I didn't know his movements until he was on my porch about three steps from my door. When I found him, my mind raced with questions. What does he want? Who is he? Is he stalking me? What's he going to do when he reaches the door? He would just stand there, watching the door. All you could see was his chest rise and fall as he waited. I had lived in my home for about a year when I discovered him. My boyfriend gave me the ring doorbell as a housewarming present. He's protective, so it seemed typical. My ring footage only went back six months, and he was there like clockwork, two times a week, every week. Around 2 a.m., he would show up. He would be gone by the 6 a.m. screenshot. The camera only started picking up his motion about two months ago. It could have started months before that, but I wouldn't know. How long was he planning this? What was he planning? When I first found him, I dismissed him as someone who was probably high on stuff. Then I kept scrolling, and he was there again, again, and again. By the time I realized what had been happening, my hands felt weak and my heart thumped in my chest. I immediately called my boyfriend. I explained what I found, and he came right over to see the footage. I 
It was a Saturday, so we had two nights before he would return. My boyfriend drove me to the police station to see what they could do. They agreed it seemed concerning, but they couldn't do anything until a crime had been committed. They suggested waiting until he came again and calling the cops when he arrived. We decided that was the best idea. In the meantime, my boyfriend decided I needed some tools for self-defense. He bought me pepper spray and a taser, and he insisted on buying me a handgun. I suggested a switchblade instead because guns make me nervous. He insisted. He even took me to a shooting range on Sunday to try and convince me. Still, I refused. He was annoyed, but I'm allowed boundaries even in the face of danger. Monday night came around, and I asked my boyfriend if he could stay the night with me. He said, of course. I actually already thought I was. Knowing what's been happening, I couldn't let you stay there alone tonight. He always made me feel safe and made me smile. I remember when I first met him in a coffee shop. I overheard him order a cordado and mustered the courage to ask him what it was. I just wanted an excuse to talk to him. We laugh about it now, but when I first walked up to him, I remember it being so difficult to ask him the question because he had such a severe scowl on his face. I thought he was scowling at me, but he explained he just had one of those faces that looks angry at rest, resting bitch face. His whole demeanor changed when I gave him my number felt like he opened up to me. His scowl turned into a smirk. His hard eyes softened. We've been together ever since. When he came over on Monday, we did what we normally do when we hang out. I made us dinner, and then we watched a movie. As I was scrolling through the movies, he walked around my living room. He stopped in front of my bookshelves and started assessing them. I didn't know you went to Roosevelt Middle School. He turned to me, excited. Oh yeah, I said uneasily. In the middle school, you're either weird or an asshole, and I was the latter. I was a mean tween, easily a bully. I was ashamed of many things I did at that age. I don't really remember middle school, I told him, hoping he didn't remember me. Worst years of my life, he responded. I feel you there. He laughed. I'm not finding any movies. Just want to watch an episode of Kitchen Nightmares and call it a night? He smiled at me and nodded his head. He joined me on the couch and wrapped his arms around me. I fell asleep during the episode. I woke up to my boyfriend nudging me. He'd carried me down the hall to my bed. He whispered, He's here. Okay, let's call the police. Wait, let me talk to him first. That sounds stupid, I responded. He assured me he had a plan. I told him I would still call the police, but he took my phone. He insisted I trust him, so I gave in. He left the room and I followed behind just in case. When my boyfriend opened the door, the man rushed at him and stabbed him in the stomach. My boyfriend kneeled over and groaned in pain. The man pushed him inside and leaned him against the wall. My boyfriend sank to the ground, holding the knife stuck in his abdomen. I fled to the bathroom and locked the door. I looked around my bathroom for things I could use as his defense. At that moment, I was annoyed at myself for not letting my boyfriend get me a gun. All I could find was hairspray, which I hoped could mimic pepper spray. I watched the crack below the door for his shadow. I opened the door out to smack him in the face. I was successful, but when I turned, I saw my boyfriend standing upright. He held a patch of ketchup in one hand. He tasted his wound. Yummy, he said. In his other hand was a white cloth that he put over my nose and mouth. Slowly, everything faded to black.
when I came to my senses, I was tied to a chair. The man and my boyfriend were drinking beer on my couch, talking and laughing. I had to clear my throat to get their attention. Aha! The princess is awake! said the man. He wasn't wearing a mask anymore. He had sandy blonde hair and two pronounced scars on his right cheek. Remember me? he said with the grin. I shook my head. What about him? he pointed at my boyfriend. Surely you remember him. I was confused. The man laughed. She really doesn't remember. You were right. Stupid bitch. My boyfriend said with a monotone as he took a sip of beer. What's happening? I started to struggle with a zip tie holding my wrist together. Let me tell you, the man began. Once upon a time, there was a little boy in seventh grade named Artie. This little boy got in a bad accident with a fierce dog that scarred him for life. The boy grew up always insecure about his scars, always feeling ugly. Then along came a little girl who found the scars oh so funny. Every day in science class, she would mock him for his scars. Every day for a year. Some of her jokes really stuck and would be repeated by their classmates. She gave him the nickname Scardy. My heart stopped. I looked up and I remembered his scars. I am so sorry. I promise I've changed. Artie hushed me. Your boyfriend and I go way back, sweetie. I'm surprised you don't remember him too. After all, you're why everyone thought he peed his pants in gym class. Tears began to gather in my eyes. I looked at my boyfriend. Charlie? You told me your name was Robbie. He didn't even turn to look at me. Artie continued. Charlie was disgusted to see you in the coffee shop and even more disgusted you would try to talk to him. When he realized you didn't remember him and was hitting on him, he devised an idea. A plan for revenge. Well, he didn't hatch out a brilliant plan until you told him you were moving. Then, it just poured out of him like Mozart writing a melody. It was something to behold. Marty kept talking, but... I zoned out. I dated him for a year and a half, and it had all been a lie. All the late night talks, sweet goodbye kisses, and loving words were all acts. I interrupted Artie. What are you going to do? He was happy with the question. He began musing about what my boyfriend and him would fantasize about. Horrible stories, none I would care to repeat. Is it really worth going to prison for? I understand I was horrible, trust me. I'm so ashamed when I look back on those days. I wish I could go back and be better, but I'm better now. Please let me go. People will find me. They'll know to look for me. I pleaded. Artie danced around. Thrilled, I was begging. While he celebrated, he began to explain how he would scar me. He said he'd start at my legs and work up, even slicing the lips between my legs. As he explained what he would do to my arms and torso, he started on my legs. He slashed X's around my ankles. Through the sharp pain, I tried to break my hands free. I struggled and wiggled to try and loosen the zip ties. Artie slapped me and got real close to my face. I think you are so ugly, human being. I don't ever want to stoop to your level. His words were a cold slap, more painful than any cut. His hatred, a mirror reflecting the ugliness I had once embodied. Tears stung my eyes, blurring the world into a bloody, chaotic mess. In the days that followed, 
I grappled with the wreckage of my life. The scars on my ankles mirrored the ones on my soul, permanent reminders of my cruelty and its consequences. The path ahead was long, paved with regret and healing, but with each step, I vowed to carry the lesson etched in flesh and blood. Kindness is the only weapon that leaves no scars. We were supposed to have a beautiful honeymoon in Aspen, Colorado. My parents' rich friends offered us their cabins so we could save money after spending most of what we had on our wedding. Honestly, it was going to be a nicer honeymoon than either Jorge or I ever dreamed. It was a beautiful little cabin deep in the Rockies. It had not one, but two hot tubs. One was outside, and one was inside. Well, technically, one was a bathtub, but it had jets. So in my book, it was a hot tub. We planned to shack up all week, and during the day, we would enjoy what the mountains had to offer. We were going to ski, go tubing, ice skating, and more. It was going to be so romantic, but of course, it had to be derailed. On our way, a heavy snowstorm rolled in. Never have I seen a blizzard this intense. It was a complete whiteout. We couldn't even see the car in front of us. Jorge was leaning over the steering wheel, squinting his eyes, trying to see the road. Even with our brights on, we couldn't see anything. We had no choice but to pull over and wait for the snow to let up. After 30 minutes, the snow started coming down harder. We decided there was no way we would make it to the cabin, so we needed to find a hotel to stay at. As I started calling around to find a vacancy, I realized we weren't the only ones who needed to stop for the night because of the storm. I'm not super high maintenance, but I have to think about cockroaches. So, I was desperate to find a place that wasn't a rundown motel. We came to this conclusion much later than most, so we had no choice. The only place we found was a Motel 6 nestled deep in an obscure mountain town. It was about 30 minutes down the road, according to Google Maps, but it took us an hour to get to the hotel. We had to move at a snail's pace so we wouldn't slide off the road. Jorge was relieved when he saw the neon blue Motel 6 sign amidst the white. I was filled with dread. In my experience, motels like this were always infested and gross. What a lovely way to start our honeymoon. We got our room keys and rushed into the room. The door was so light. It felt like reinforced cardboard, not the most secure. The room smelled faintly of pee. We could hear our neighbors on both sides. On the side by the TV, they were yelling at their kids to stop jumping on the bed. And on the other side by the bed, they were having loud, passionate sex. That could be us. I laughed and sat down on the bed. The jolt of my body sitting down stirred a couple roaches, and they ran out from under the bed. I screamed and jumped up on the bed, and more scurried out. I looked at my husband and said, I'm not sleeping tonight. They're going to be crawling all over us. I'll protect you, Jorge said with a smile. His soft smile and kind eyes calmed me. I went to use the bathroom, and I found the source of the pee smell. The pink tiles around the toilet and the shower had a yellow residue with dust sticking to them. The mirror was cracked down in the middle. I looked at the shower and wondered if someone had ever been stabbed in there like the movie Psycho. I came out of the shower and told Jorge, I'm not using that shower either. Something is going to come up the drain. Jorge started to explain how he wasn't thrilled to be there either. I was thinking, he said, the storm might let up in a couple hours. I'm happy to drive through the night to get to the cabin so we aren't sandwiched between two passionate lovers and a strung out family. That way, we can really enjoy our honeymoon. He came over to me, grabbed my waist, and pulled me towards him. That's why I love you. We sat on the bed watching Family Guy for hours, but the storm never let up. It became pretty clear we weren't going anywhere until the morning. Jorge left to pick us up some pizza. While he was gone, I sat in the middle of the bed, holding my knees, anxiously scanning the area around me for bugs. Suddenly, someone tried to open the door. They turned the knob and shook the door. I almost spoke up, but I felt I needed to stay quiet. A silhouette appeared in the window. It was man-shaped. He held his hand to try and look through the window. It looked like he may have had a gun. 
I texted Jorge to be careful coming in because there appeared to be a man with a gun circling the motel. The man moved on and soon Jorge was back with our pizza. We ate and then cuddled in the gross bed while watching Family Guy. Both of us succumbed to a light slumber. Around 2 a.m., the man came back. He started shaking the door more aggressively. He was yelling. Hey, hello, anyone home? He pounded on the door and the window. Each time his fist came down on the door, it looked like the door was just going to fall over. Jorge turned the light on by reflex, alerting the man that someone was inside. The man started pounding harder until he punched a hole through the door. Jesus Christ, Jorge said. He quickly got up, making sure I was behind him. What do you want? We don't want any trouble. The man shoved his arm through the hole and he was holding a gun. He fired off a round. Luckily, he didn't hit either of us. Okay, no need to do that. What do you want? Jorge repeated himself. Money, give me your money. I took off my wedding ring just in case things got worse. I didn't want to lose it. Jorge went to his wallet and my purse to collect all our cash. The man shoved his head into the hole. His skin was pale and veiny. He had wild hair and eyes. He looked at me and he gave me a creepy smile. Most of his teeth were missing and the remaining ones were rotted yellow. Hey, pretty lady, he said to me. Jorge turned around and barked at him to leave me alone. The junkie mimicked my husband and went back to staring at me with his unsettling grin. I could show you a fun night, pretty lady, the junkie told me. Much more wild than this vanilla piece of shit. Jorge waved a wad of cash at him. Here, this is what you want, right? I kind of want her too. Jorge started to get angry. You can have the cash. Put the gun down and back up so I can drop the cash outside for you. The junkie bowed away, and Jorge slowly reached his hand out of the door hole to drop the cash. Right when he let go of the money, the junkie fired off another round. The bullet went through the door into Jorge's thigh. Jorge! I yelled. Jorge fell to the ground. The junkie let out a weird little laugh and took off. Jorge's leg was bleeding badly, but finally, the snow was beginning to dissipate. I called 911, and we got an ambulance to take us to the nearest hospital. Jorge was okay, but we spent the first half of our honeymoon in the hospital. We still got to spend time in the cozy cabin, but what we could do was limited because of Jorge's injury. We decided at some point down the line to try to go on a honeymoon again. This time, we agreed to go somewhere warm, tropical place that wouldn't be cursed with a blizzard. I hate my birthday. Always have. Birthdays are meant to be a celebration of someone in their life. But somehow, mine always ended up being about my little brother. This persisted into adulthood. The conversation always revolves around him and what he's doing. I'm lucky even to be acknowledged. Since this is how my birthday goes, I always feel small and worthless. After fading into the background of my own birthday year after year, I decided to celebrate by taking a solo vacation to a mountain spa resort. The night before I left for the resort, I told my mom my itinerary. She wasn't happy I was celebrating by myself and disagreed that my birthday always ends up being about my brother. She started harping on me about it, so I had to ask if she wanted to hear what I was doing or not. She said yes, because it's the only way she can feel involved. I rolled my eyes. I told her I would leave for work on Friday and get to the resort later. I planned to order food and just hang out in the hotel room. Saturday was my spa day. I would spend my birthday being pampered like a queen, far away from my phone. For Sunday, I planned to check out and do an easy hike before heading back to the city. My mom wasn't all that excited for me, but it wasn't her birthday. I remember feeling so much peace as I rolled up to the resort. It was nestled deep in the mountains and you could see the snow-covered peaks in the distance. It was the beginning of summer, so I was surprised to see that there was still some snow on them. I felt so far away from the drama my family was trying to cause and the hustle of my day-to-day -day life. Inside of the resort added to my peace. It smelled of fresh wood and was decorated like a cabin. Although it was huge, it felt quaint and cozy. 
A lady was complaining about the lack of towels that I had to wait behind her before I could check in. I couldn't help but notice the man who came in after me. He stood about a head taller than me and had dark curly hair. There felt like electricity between us as he waited behind me. The lady got her towels and I stepped up to check in. The lady was kind and gave me my room key quickly. I thanked her and as I turned, I bumped into the gorgeous tall man behind me. Oh, sorry, I said. I looked up at him and he had friendly brown eyes that sparkled a bit. It's okay, I don't mind beautiful women bumping into me. He flashed his big white smile at me, revealing his dimples. I laughed nervously, not knowing how to react. I don't get hit on very often. I bent over to start gathering my stuff, and he helped. This might be a long shot, and I know it's late, but is there any chance you would want to grab something to eat with me after I check in? Blood rushed to my cheeks. Yeah, I could do that. I was just going to eat alone in my room anyway, so some company might be nice. I smiled at him. Great. Want to meet down here in 45 minutes? I nodded and told him I'd see him in a bit. What's your name? I asked before leaving. Adam. And yours? Steph. I'll see you soon, Steph. He smiled at me one more time. We met in the lobby and he told me he found this Mexican joint with good reviews. I told him how great that sounded since Mexican is my favorite. I mentioned to him that I was on my birthday vacation. So, Adam told the waitress to get free dessert and to ask her not to come out singing because he thought it might make me uncomfortable. I kept being stunned by how he guessed everything right. He ordered a bottle of red wine, which happened to be my favorite. When I eat out at Mexican places, I switch off getting enchiladas and chile rellenos. I got enchiladas last time I was out, and that's what he ordered. I was able to have a bite of my two favorite dishes. We got along so well too. Adam was a photographer, and he was in the mountains to get some nature shots. We had so much in common. I was convinced we had the potential to go somewhere. I almost asked him back to my room, but I didn't want to rush things. Before we said goodnight, we exchanged numbers. He told me he hoped to run into me again before he left. The following day, I woke up, brushed my teeth, and headed to the spa. All day, I was pampered. As they were massaging my feet and arms at the same time, I felt like I made the best decision to celebrate alone. For the first time, I felt good on my birthday. And as a bonus, I met Adam. At that moment, everything felt right. As I was leaving the spa, I saw Adam in the lobby. We stopped and chatted briefly. He invited me to dinner again, and looking into his brown eyes, I wanted so badly to say yes. Except I had a bunch of voicemails and texts I needed to answer. I couldn't block down my loved ones completely. I explained that I needed to call my friends and family, but I suggested we get dinner when we were both back in the city. His eyes lit up at the suggestion. I woke up early the next day for my hike. I planned to return to the hotel after the hike to shower, but I changed my mind. I decided to head home right after the hike. What are the odds? He laughed. We hiked the trail together, stopping now and again so he could take a picture. One time, he turned the camera to me and asked me to smile. We made small talk. Adam asked what I planned to do when I returned to the city. I explained that I would have dinner with my family and how they weren't happy I chose to celebrate alone. Adam's head twitched to the side. They don't understand how lucky they are to have you in their lives. It ticks me off. I hadn't said much about my family, so I didn't know where this came from. As we walked up to the waterfall, he said, Like two years ago, when you wanted to go to that Mediterranean place for your birthday, but for some reason, you ended up going to Applebee's. Your brother isn't even that great. He's a Starbucks barista. It just takes me off. My stomach dropped. How did he know what happened two years ago? I definitely didn't mention it. I acted like I didn't hear him, but my guard was up. I started thinking how he was always in the lobby right when I was. He was there when I checked in. He was there when I came out of the spa. He was even there for the hike at the same time as me. He turned to me and said he was going to get closer to snap some pictures. I told him he wouldn't want his backpack to get wet so I could hold on to it. He was hesitant, but ended up giving it to me. Once he was far enough away, 
accepted. Inside, I found snacks, rope, duct tape, a map, and a small bag containing a white powder. In the small pocket, I found pictures of me. Some look like they were from years ago. There was one of me brushing my teeth that I have no idea how he could get, unless he hacked into my phone. I checked his wallet and took a picture of his ID. My heart was racing. I slowly put Adam's bag down and started running back down the trail. Luckily, it was a short hike, so I jogged back down to my car. About halfway through, I heard him yell my name. He yelled it again and again, getting angrier with each call out. I got to my car, got in it, and drove away. When I got to the city, I went to the police department immediately. I told them what had happened, what I had found, and his information. They told me as long as there was no assault or trespassing, there wasn't a whole lot they could do. They recommended getting a new phone and laptop because he probably hacked them and to consider relocating. They weren't going to do anything for me. I haven't seen Adam since the waterfall, but I did what the cops told me. I got all new electronics and moved to a new place. I only told a select few where I moved to and started guarding my personal information. I look over my shoulder, check for cars following me, and look for him in grocery stores, but I still haven't seen him. I don't think I'll ever shake this uneasy feeling, because he had been watching me for years without me knowing. So who's to say he's not still watching? A few nights ago, I went to 7-Eleven with my boyfriend Martin. He had a craving for onion rings. He parked just outside the building and said he'd wait in the car while I ran inside. I hated when Martin ordered me around like that. He was the reason we were here, and yet I had to do everything. I didn't argue though. I figured it would just take a minute. When I got inside, I was the only customer there. It was nighttime, and the man behind the counter looked half asleep. I gave him the sack of onion rings, and he very slowly typed into the register. It was almost comical how slow he was moving, as if he enjoyed watching me wait. Finally, he gave me my change and I hurried out of there. But once I stepped onto the parking lot, I saw that our car was empty. The driver's side door was opened and Martin was gone. I knew he didn't go inside, so I looked around the parking lot and I couldn't find him anywhere. Instantly panicked, I ran back inside and told the cashier that my boyfriend was missing. He looked upset, but I could tell that something was off. He didn't seem surprised at all that someone had gone missing outside his shop. The cashier was hiding something from me. He knew that someone was going to take Martin. That was probably why he moved so slow whenever I was at the counter. He needed me to stay inside for as long as possible while Martin was taken. At least, that's what I was thinking. I reached across the counter and grabbed him by the shirt. Where's my boyfriend? I screamed in his face. He got this panicked look on his face and then reached for something behind the counter. Before I knew it, he pulled out a rifle. I backed away with my hands up, worried that he might shoot me. But instead, he ran around the counter with the rifle in his hands, then raced out the front door. He turned back towards me and said, wait here. Then he ran into the parking lot. I tried to see where he went through the window, but it was too dark. I heard two gunshots and then nothing. I stood waiting in the 7-Eleven for a long time, but the cashier never came back. I guess I was too confused by the whole situation to even think about calling the police. I finally came to my senses and grabbed my phone, calling 911 and reporting a kidnapping, even though I didn't know for certain that that was what had happened. The comp lady said the officers would arrive in less than 10 minutes. She told me to stay exactly where I was. I waited in the 7-Eleven, staring at the wide front windows to see if anyone was coming. With my phone still in my hands, I decided to call Martin's cell phone and hoped he'd answer. All I wanted was for him to explain that this was just some big mistake, or maybe it was a practical joke. Martin didn't answer. 
Even though I was more scared than I'd ever been in my entire life, I had to find out what was going on. Slowly, I walked out of the building and looked around. Our car was still empty. I walked around the corner of the building. I was so focused on the space around me that I didn't see where I was walking. I walked right into something soft on the ground. It was the cashier, lying dead on the pavement. His rifle sat next to his lifeless body, a scalpel sticking out of his neck. God, I felt horrible for the poor man, but at least this told me that I was going in the right direction. I picked up his rifle and continued along the side of the building until I saw a small shed hidden in the back. The door was halfway open, so I slowly leaned inside and saw exactly where Martin had gone. He was lying on an operating table while the man in a dirty lab coat was cutting into him with a scalpel. Martin wasn't struggling, but I could see his chest rising and fall. He was still alive. Welcome, someone said to me, but it wasn't the doctor. It was a beautiful woman in a short red dress. What are you doing to my boyfriend? I asked. The doctor didn't stop working. He continued to slice into Martin's stomach. The woman laughed. Harvesting, she answered. They were stealing organs. They set up a makeshift operating room in this little shed, and from the looks of it, she must have waited outside the 7-Eleven to seduce men into following her here. I could hear Martin groan on the table. He was too weak to speak but he must have been able to feel what they were doing to him. The woman stepped closer. Is this your boyfriend? She asked. He didn't act like he was dating anyone when I found him. I remembered my time inside the 7-Eleven. I was in there for less than five minutes, and in that time, Martin had been seduced, injected, and taken away. He must have not have put up a fight at all. He must have been too horny to care. I was horrified at what they were doing to him, but I also felt deeply betrayed. It was his own fault that this woman had tricked him. He should have just waited in a stupid car. You look healthy, she said. I can make a lot of money selling you for parts. I stepped backward and she grabbed me by the shoulders. She was stronger than I realized. And behind her, the doctor kept cutting into Martin. It looks like you have two choices, the woman said. You can stay here with your boyfriend, but we'll have to take you apart. Or you could pretend you didn't see anything and leave him to us. I knew I should have fought back. I loved Martin and the things they were doing to him was just awful. But on the other hand, the police were on their way. And more importantly, Martin had betrayed me. So I said goodbye and walked out. When I got back to the front of the parking lot, the police had already arrived. Several of them were examining the cashier's body. I walked to one of the policemen and told them about the shed. He pulled aside a couple of his fellow cops and raced around the corner. By the time they got to the shed, the woman and the doctor were already gone. Martin was still laying there. Well, most of them anyway. I came home to visit my parents for spring break. Hadn't seen them since I started college, but, but we texted every day. They were expecting me on Sunday, but I was able to get back a day early. I texted my mom about the change of plans, but she didn't respond. When I got there, the house was empty, even though both my parents' cars were still in the driveway. I looked around the whole house, but they weren't there. Then I called mom again. Still no answer. I kind of felt like an intruder in my own home. I went into the kitchen to get some food when I noticed a note on the fridge. It said, Dear Andrew, we had to leave and we're not sure when we'll come back. Sorry. Right away, I got this horrible feeling. 
The letter didn't look like either of my parents' handwriting. And worst of all, they never called me Andrew. They always called me Drew. I knew that someone else had written the note. I tried to calm myself down. I told myself that they probably had to hurry off somewhere and they asked someone else to write the note for them. I assumed it was their next door neighbor Maria, who always had been like a second mother to me. Just in case, I decided to go next door and ask. I walked to Maria's house and knocked, but a stranger opened the door. He was a tall man with neck tattoos and a really angry expression. He asked me what I wanted. I asked if Maria was home and he said, well, you must be Andrew. You're here early. Then he explained that Maria had moved out. He had just bought the house. He didn't tell me his name, though. I knew that something wasn't right. I could see into the house behind him, and all of Maria's family photos were still up on the walls. He saw how nervous I was and told me to go back home and wait for my parents to return. I tried to ask him if he knew anything about where they were, but he just slammed the door in my face. I went back home and made sure all the doors and windows were locked. After that, I just sat on the sofa. I had no idea what to do. After a while, I thought of something. I pulled out my phone and opened my Facebook. Maria was my Facebook friend, so I figured that if she'd moved, she would have posted something about it. Instead, I saw a bunch of messages on her wall from different friends asking where she was and why she wasn't answering any calls. Now I was getting really worried. My fingers trembling. I closed Facebook and started to dial 911. But before I could finish the call, I heard someone unlocking the front door. I hoped that my parents were coming back. But when the door opened, I saw that tattooed man from next door. Why did he have a house key? He walked in like he owned the place. He turned toward me, smiling. I'm glad you decided to stay, he said. Who are you? What do you want? He slowly stepped forward, still smiling. He didn't have any weapons, but he was at least 50 pounds bigger than me. I started to back away, but he kept coming. He got really close to my face and whispered, Do you want to be taken to your parents? I still had no idea what was going on, but I knew that this man was dangerous. He probably took my parents, just like he'd taken Maria. But why? What was his plan? I tried to be brave. No! I shouted. Just tell me where they are! He shook his head, still smiling. He said that he couldn't explain what happened. He'd have to show me. By then, fear was taking over. I was frozen in place. I still had my phone in my hands, but I was too afraid to call 911. I knew that if I moved at all, he'd attack. You have five seconds, he said. Come with me. Then he started counting down. I didn't say anything. Five, four, three. When he reached one, he growled, too late. And then he jerked forward and grabbed me by the throat. He was so strong. I started to choke. Without realizing what I was doing, I started clawing at him. Then, I slammed my cell phone against the side of his head. That must have surprised him because he stumbled backward. I grabbed a nearby lamp and slammed it into his face. His nose started bleeding. I couldn't believe that I had the strength to fight back like that. I stood over him as he fell to the floor. My phone had fallen during the struggle, so I grabbed it and ran for the front door. Behind me, I could hear the tattooed man laughing hysterically. I could have kept running, but I stopped and turned around. The man was sitting on the floor, blood rushing out of his nose. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a knife. Then, without saying anything, he took the knife and stabbed himself right in the neck. I watched in horror as he started to bleed out, and the last thing he said was, <laughs> I guess you'll never know what happened to them. Then he stopped moving. I stepped onto the port and called 911. The police station wasn't too far away. Two cop cars pulled up in less than five minutes. They ran inside and saw the dead man in the living room. 
One officer stayed behind and asked me what happened. I was so overwhelmed that I couldn't speak. She helped calm me down, and then I explained everything. After that, the police searched both houses, but they couldn't find anything. They assured me that they'd figure out who this man was and what he'd done to my parents. That night, I went to my friend's house and stayed the night. I'm still waiting for answers, though. It's been three weeks, and the dead man still hasn't been identified. I don't know who he was or what happened to my parents. And worst of all, I don't know if the man was working alone. Deep down, I'm scared. I think that my parents are gone. My friends, please tell me what could have happened to them. I grew up in San Diego, so I didn't have much experience with snow. I had always wanted to have a traditional white Christmas like in the movies. So when my boyfriend Freddy asked me to go with him to his hometown in Wisconsin, I immediately said yes. I hadn't dated Freddy for very long, so I didn't know if it would last. I really wanted a memorable Christmas though, so I jumped at the chance to join him. We flew there in the middle of December when I could finally take some time off of work. His mom Kathy picked us up at the airport. She was a large, friendly woman, the kind of person you'd expect to see in Wisconsin. She gave me a big hug and made me feel like a member of the family. On the long drive to her house, she asked me all sorts of questions and kept complimenting me on my looks. She said she was so happy that Freddie had finally fallen in love with someone nice especially after his last relationship had ended so badly. I didn't know much about Freddy's dating history, but I didn't want to pry. I could tell from his expression that the topic was making him uncomfortable. Once we arrived, Freddy gave me a grand tour of his house. We walked around the snowy yard, and everything seemed perfect. Then, when we got back inside, Kathy had a huge meal prepared for us. As we ate, she kept asking me more questions about my life. She mentioned a big family reunion they were planning for the summer, assuming that I'd join them. I didn't have the heart to tell her that Freddie and I weren't as serious as she thought. I liked him a lot, but we weren't even exclusive yet. That night, Kathy showed me to the guest room. She told me that it was fine with her if Freddie and I stayed in the same room, but this was her house, so I preferred to sleep separately. I thought that that was the right thing to do, but she seemed almost disappointed when I said it. I didn't go to sleep right away. I was scrolling through my phone when I noticed that Kathy had posted a bunch of photos of me on her Instagram without my permission. I didn't even realize she had taken all those pictures. She added captions like, future daughter-in-law and welcome to the family. It made me really uncomfortable. I promised myself that I'd talk to Freddie in the morning figured he could handle his mother better than I could. Eventually, I fell asleep, but that didn't last long. I woke up in the middle of the night to noises just outside my window. I tried to tell myself that there was probably just some animal outside, nothing to worry about. But then, I heard footsteps just outside my window. I got out of bed to take a closer look. The window overlooked the snow-covered yard. I didn't see it at first, but... I noticed the footprints in the snow. Someone had walked toward my window. It had been snowing throughout the night, so the footprints were fresh. Who is out there? I got closer to the glass when a woman jumped out of the shadows. She was shivering from the cold and her face looked desperate. Please, let me in. I had no idea who this person was, but I couldn't just leave her out in the cold. I slowly opened the window and asked her where she'd come from. She immediately grabbed onto the windowsill and pulled herself into the room. She didn't give me her name, but she said that her boyfriend left her and she didn't know where to go. I assumed she was a neighbor. Without asking for permission, she sat on the bed and wrapped herself up in my blankets. It took a while for her to stop shivering. I explained that this wasn't my house. If she wanted to stay the night, I'd have to go wake up Kathy and tell her. The woman said that I didn't need to. She and Kathy were very close. I should have argued with her, 
but it was such a strange situation and I was still half asleep. So, I just sat next to her and waited for her to warm herself up. Neither of us said anything for a while until she looked into my eyes and smiled. She asked if I was Freddy's new girlfriend. I nodded. How do you know him? She didn't answer me. Instead, she said, Are you too happy? Uh... Do you love each other? The bluntness of her questioning finally forced me to wake up and realize how weird this all was. A stranger had crawled through my window and started prying into my personal life. In a very direct way, I told her that I could call for someone to come and pick her up. Her smile instantly disappeared. All at once, she glared at me with pure hatred and said, You don't deserve him. Then, she grabbed me by the throat and shoved me onto the bed. It happened so fast, I could barely process what was going on. I tried to shove her off me, but she refused to let go. Oh, bah, he's mine. He's mine. He's mine. He's mine. He's mine. We prayed that Eddie could hear us from the other room and come to my rescue. He didn't, though. The woman kept squeezing my throat until I almost blacked out. But with my last bit of strength, I punched her in the side of the head. She fell off the bed and I could finally breathe. I watched her jump back up. For a second, it looked like she was going to attack me again. But instead, she screamed obscenities at me and then dove out the window. Before I knew it, she had disappeared into the darkness outside. As I struggled to catch my breath, my bedroom door creaked open and Kathy walked in. She asked me what had happened and I told her that a mad woman had come inside and attacked me. As I was talking, Freddy walked in too. He asked me to describe what the woman looked like. I described her as best I could and his expression dropped. That's Lacey, my ex-girlfriend, he said. She must have seen the photos mom took of you. No wonder he never mentioned his ex before. Lacey was a complete psycho. Freddy wrapped me in a hug and told me that I was safe now. Kathy watched us from the side of the room, her face full of concern. Then she said something that I'll never forget. You'll always have my son to protect you. It seemed like such a strange thing to say, as if the attack had somehow brought me and Eddie closer together. I'll leave you two alone, she said as she left the room. After she was gone, Freddy kept apologizing for what his ex had tried to do. He vowed that no matter what, he'd watch out for me. He'd take care of me. Even though we were still at his mom's house, Freddy and I got into the same bed together. His arms were wrapped around me. I felt very warm and protected. Maybe I was starting to have real feelings for him. I was about to drift off to sleep when I noticed something on the floor just below the window. Lacey had accidentally left her phone behind. I got out of bed to grab it. Freddy asked me what I was doing, so I showed him the phone. Don't look at it! He shouted. He jumped out of the bed and tried to grab the phone from my hand, but I wouldn't let him. I didn't understand why he was acting like that. As he tried to take the phone from me, I turned it on and saw that the screen was already open on a text exchange. Don't read that! He screamed. Too late. I already saw that the texts were from him. He had messaged Lacey an hour before, telling her to check out his mom's Instagram, egging her on and basically challenging her to come over and confront me. I can explain, he said, but he didn't need to explain. I knew exactly what he did. He wanted his psycho ex to come over. He wanted her to scare me, to attack me, just so I could find comfort in his arms. This was all a setup and it had almost worked. I threw the phone at him and then stormed out of the room. He begged me to stay, but I wouldn't listen. I couldn't even look him in the eyes. I used my own phone to call an Uber and I got out of there as fast as I could. I never wanted to see him again. And I never did. I went straight to the airport and back to California. It was the worst, weirdest trip of my life. But hey, at least I got to see some snow. My ex-boyfriend Gus was absolutely terrible. 
We were together for three years before I'd finally had enough and kicked him out of my house. This happened two months ago, and ever since then, I caught him lurking around my work and watching me from a distance. He had turned into a stalker. At first, I thought it was all in my head, but over time, he started to get more confident and intrusive. He'd never say anything, and if I ever tried to confront him, he'd just run away. I started to worry for my own safety. I thought about filing a restraining order against him, but I knew that would only make him angrier. I figured the safest thing to do would be install security cameras around my house and a ring camera on my front door. Even if he never showed up to my house, at least I'd feel safer knowing that the cameras were there. After I installed the cameras, I didn't see Gus lurking around for over a week. I hoped that my nightmare was finally over, but I wasn't sure. Then Friday rolled around and I had a particularly bad day at work. I was an agent at an insurance company and I had to deliver some bad news to a couple whose apartment had burned down. Their plan didn't cover the damages and they didn't take the news well. It was a big old mess and I felt really bad about it. Obviously, I was in a bad mood when I left work that afternoon. I liked my job overall, but it was always tough to give people bad news. As I walked through the parking lot, I saw Gus hiding around the corner of my office building. He was just staring at me. Once I looked directly at him, he disappeared behind the wall. I hurried to my car and drove off. When I got home, I made sure to lock the cars and close all the windows. I was still on edge about Gus spying on me. For the next few hours, I watched TV alone even though I could barely concentrate. I hated that my ex had so much power over me. I was in the kitchen microwaving some leftovers for dinner when my phone beeped. It was an alarm for my Ring camera app. Someone was outside my front door. I opened the app and saw that Gus was standing just outside. He was wearing a ski mask. I couldn't believe it. What was he trying to do? I walked straight into my bedroom and called the police to report the trespasser. The lady on the other end said that they couldn't send any officers for another half hour. She asked me if I was in any immediate danger and I said no. That was a mistake. I reopened the app and saw that Gus was gone, but he had left a package behind. It was sitting on my welcome mat. I considered waiting for the police to check it out, but I worried that it could be a bomb or something. I walked to my front door. It was really quiet at my house and I felt very alone. I looked through the people to make sure that Gus wasn't hiding somewhere and then I slowly opened the door. The box was small and cardboard. It didn't have any markings on it. I didn't know what I expected. If it really was a bomb, did I seriously think that it would be taking away or something? I realized that getting near it was a bad idea. So I left where it was and headed back inside. I was already too late. Gus jumped out of the bushes before I could get through the door and grabbed me by the waist. He started pulling me into the darkness. I screamed for help, but I knew that no one was close enough to hear me. Gus dragged me through the thick bushes until we were at the side of my house. Then he threw me onto the ground and stood over me. I begged him to stop. I told him that I wasn't interested in him anymore. I told him to get out of there before the police arrived. He started laughing, and that's when I noticed that his voice sounded different. I looked up at him and realized that he was taller than Gus, fatter too. This wasn't Gus at all, it was someone else under the ski mask. You ruined my life, the man said. All at once, I realized who it was. This was the man from my office, the man who'd been rejected for his insurance claim. He tracked me down, used an empty package to lure me outside, and now who knows what he was planning to do to me. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a pistol. Was he going to shoot me? God, I was so stupid for thinking that this was my ex-boyfriend. I looked all around, desperate to see if there were anyone nearby. The police still hadn't arrived. Of course, the yard was empty. There was a fence blocking us from the main road, so none of my neighbors would be able to see me even if they were walking on the street. The man cocked his gun. I could see him smile through his mask. No one is going to help you, he said. Before he could shoot me, I saw someone nearby. 
there was a dark figure standing in the back of my yard watching us. At first, I thought it was the man's wife. But then, I realized it was Gus. He was here. He had come here to stalk me and obviously didn't expect an even more dangerous person to show up at the same time. I turned to him, pleading for him to come and save me. He considered it for a second, but then he turned around and started to run away. As Gus was trying to climb my fence to get out of there, the man in the mask noticed him too. Who's that? He asked me. I was going to tell him the truth, but then I realized that this could be my chance to escape. That's my boss. He's the real reason your life is ruined. The masked man instantly left me behind and started running toward Gus. As Gus was just about to crawl over my fence, the man grabbed him by his feet and pulled him back to the ground. I could hear Gus screaming toward the man, trying to explain that I had lied about who he was. There were some bushes in the way, so I couldn't see what happened next. But I heard a struggle, and then I heard a gunshot. Then everything went quiet. Less than a minute later, the police arrived. One officer ran toward me and asked if I was okay. I shakily pointed the back of my yard. I watched the cop disappear behind the bushes. I thought about following him, but I was too afraid of what I'd see. That was the right decision, because when the cop came back, he said that he found my boyfriend dead on the ground. No one else was there. A few weeks later, the masked man was found and arrested. He confessed to everything. He's in jail now, and my ex-boyfriend is dead. I'm finally safe, but just in case, I still have my ring camera. And if anyone drops off any mysterious boxes on my porch, I'll leave them just where they are. My grandma is 92, and she refuses to go to a retirement home. Last year, my brother Andy and I decided to move in with her to make sure she didn't hurt herself. It was a difficult situation for both of us, but we loved our grandma very much. We weren't allowed to change much about her house when we moved in, but I made sure to upgrade her TV so that we could watch Netflix. I had a pretty busy job, so I didn't have time to watch a lot of movies. But Andy was home a lot more than I was, and I knew that he had his favorite shows that he always binged. One night, I came home from work while Andy was out with some friends. I checked in on Grandma, who was asleep in her room as usual and decided to check out Netflix. I was scrolling through the movies when I noticed something weird. There were dozens of half-finished documentaries in the continue watching queue. I knew that Andy usually preferred stupid comedies, and I'd literally never seen him watch a documentary before. I started going through the titles and realized that every documentary was about people murdering their family members. It was the kind of true crime stuff that I'd never really seen before. One was about a wife poisoning her husband. Another was about a daughter murdering her parents and then hiding the bodies. But most of them were about children and grandchildren killing off their elderly relatives so they could get their inheritance. At first, I didn't think much of it. I know that when people are binging TV shows, they sometimes go down these weird rabbit holes and end up watching things that you wouldn't expect them to watch. But the more I thought about it, the more unnerved I got. This didn't feel like innocent binge watching. It felt like research. The only explanation I could think of was that Andy was planning on murdering our grandma. We both knew that we were the only beneficiaries in her will. Grandma had a lot of money saved up, and once she died, we'd inherit the house along with millions of dollars. I never would have thought that Andy would be sick enough to hurt someone like our grandma, but just in case, I decided to keep an eye on him. For the next few weeks, I spent more time at home. I started noticing little things like how Andy always made grandma's meals and organized her medication. While I offered to help, he refused. He really seemed like he was hiding something. I never said anything to him or grandma, but I noticed grandma would always glance at him suspiciously whenever he gave her the nightly pills. I also saw that he was watching more of those true crime documentaries on Netflix, though he never watched them when I was in the room. I just saw them pop up in the watch again and continue watching cues. I really should have said something, but I was honestly getting a little scared. One night, I came home early from work and decided to talk to Grandma. I kept things pretty vague, but I asked her how she was feeling and if something was bothering her. She told me that she could barely get out of bed 
and that she always felt worse after she took her medications. That's when I knew Andy was slowly poisoning her like in those documentaries. I kissed her on the forehead and told her that everything would be okay. About an hour later, Andy got home and walked straight into the kitchen. He didn't realize that I was there. I watched him as he fixed Grandma her tea and organized her pills. When he was finished, I told him that I could take everything up to Grandma's room. He refused, so I made up an excuse about having car problems and asked him to go check it out in the garage. I knew that that would keep him distracted long enough. He hurried outside, which gave me enough time to dump out her tea and make a new cup myself. I also took out the pills that he put on her plate and replaced them with the new ones from her medicine box. I figured that if Grandma didn't get sick that night, that I know that Andy was poisoning her. I had just finished pouring her replacement tea when a voice shouted at me from the hallway. What are you doing? I turned around and saw Grandma glaring at me. I told her that I was just getting her pills ready, but she didn't listen. She started charging toward me. You're the one poisoning me! I thought it was Andy, but it was you all along! No, I would never... I saw you! You dumped out my tea and replaced it with poison. You're just as bad as those psychos on TV. That's when I realized the truth. Grandma was the one watching those documentaries when we weren't around. Andy was never trying to kill her. She just thought that he was. And now her suspicions had turned towards me. I tried to explain myself, but Grandma was hysterical. I'd never seen her move so fast. She slammed me up against the counter and reached around to open a drawer. She pulled out a butcher knife. I thought you loved me. Before I could move, she took the knife and slammed it straight through my hand and into the kitchen counter. It happened so fast, my brain couldn't register the pain at first. Then she punched me right in the face. I couldn't believe how strong she was for a 90-year-old woman. I tried to move out of the way, but my hand was pinned to the counter. I grabbed the handle of the knife and quickly pulled it out. Then I threw the knife across the room so Grandma couldn't grab it. I started to scream for help, but Grandma grabbed me by the throat and squeezed. I couldn't breathe. With her free hand, she snatched the cup of tea and started pouring the hot liquid down my throat. Drink it. Drink your poison. I coughed up as much as I could. I was slowly blacking out until all of a sudden, her hand let go of my throat. I fell to the floor, gasping for air. When my eyes could finally focus, I looked up and saw that Andy had returned. He was holding Grandma's arms behind her back. He ordered me to call the police. Andy struggled to hold Grandma in place without hurting her for about five minutes. When the ambulance finally arrived, they sedated Grandma and took her away. A paramedic bandaged my mangled hand. All this happened about three months ago. Since then, Grandma has been living in an assisted care facility where they've been giving her new medicine to help with her paranoia. Andy and I visit her every week. The cabin looked inconspicuous and pretty enough on the outside. From the inside, it seemed a great place to be. An eco-brutalist haunt with plenty of wood and concrete. Tasteful as they came these days. Nature blending in with your living spaces. A perfect place to stay in the lush hills of Ubud Bali. I still couldn't believe that we managed to book it on Airbnb one day before we were set to leave for Bali. And it's such a great price, too. Ah, maybe they were the pregnancy hormones or my actual lack of time off, but I was excited as anyone could ever be for a trip. I mean, I never thought I would ever get to visit Bali in this lifetime, but there we were. My husband Dale and I lucked out and got free tickets from the raffle at our local supermarket, and boy, there we were. Though I have to say the cabin did have its quirks. The owner's choice of wall decor was something I couldn't wrap my head around. Everywhere I turned, there were these strange Balinese masks. They had protruding eyes, a prominent mouth with sharp, large teeth. Strange creatures that tread the line between real and not. And right by the entrance, there was a particularly large and strange one. Stranger than the rest of the bunch. The mask was hung on a column that greeted us as soon as we walked through the front door. 
It had a strange necklace tied to its neck, long hair, and complete with threatening, bulging red eyes and sharp claws. Why did the owners want this to greet everyone who walked in here? Well, different people have different tastes, I thought. Also, it could just be a cultural thing. Perhaps the masks didn't mean anything ominous for the Balinese. You could never tell. But its eyes, its bulging red eyes, made me feel uneasy. As I helped Dale roll what was left of our luggage into the cabin, I could have sworn I felt its eyes move, following us across the property. Well, we're not going to let that ruin our vacation, though. That night, Dale was quickly in a good mood again. And somehow, with the help of some wine, he managed to coax me into one, too. We hadn't made love in what felt like ages. And with me being three months pregnant, obviously something like <laughs> hadn't been a priority. <laughs> that is, until we flew all the way across the world and landed in Bali. Even after three years of marriage, he still knew just how to get things going, knowing damn well that I loved it all and wanted more. But then, out of nowhere, I swear I saw the weird mask by the front door floating in my periphery vision. It was floating on its own, swiftly making its way across the kitchen by the living room. Dale! Did you see that? The mask's alive. <laughs> huh? What mask? asked Dale. The mask by the front door. I saw it floating around behind you. Huh? Dale looked as confused as he could possibly be. Uh, hang on. Let me go check it out. And just like that, he left me. I mean, I'm glad that he's going to check it out, but leaving me alone was also not the best of solutions. I sat there taking in the cabin, tasteful gray walls and wooden floors. Well, they no longer seemed warm and inviting. That night, they seemed cold and distant. Almost void of human- <laughs> Dale scared me out of nowhere. He was wearing the Balinese mask, and I screamed at his face, running away to the bedroom and locking the door. He knocked then. Babe, he said softly. I'm sorry, okay? It was a prank thought if the two of you got acquainted, then maybe you wouldn't be so afraid of him. Nah, Dale was right. It was just a stupid mask that was hanging on the wall. I got spooked. Pregnancy hormones. Well, that's exactly what happened. I took a deep breath and opened the door, looking at Dale tentatively as he held the mask up for me. I guess it's kind of cute. His eyes lit up. Yeah, you think this guy's cute? I nodded, trying my best to show him I wasn't scared. Cuter than me, he pestered. Definitely. When in doubt, lean into it, right? Oh, then maybe I'll wear it when we get it on. That got a big laugh out of me. It was funny. I began to actually enjoy how the mask's long hair felt against my skin. But then, suddenly, he stopped over my bulging belly and began to sniff it? Dale, what are you doing? My blood ran cold. The mask's eyes moved, too. I, I, I don't know how to explain it, but it felt like the mask was wearing Dale. He was no longer in control. No. No. It, it, it was now looking at my belly with so much malice. I, I, I felt it with every inch of my body that I should run, and I did. I screamed and ran like hell out of that cabin. It chased me, at least until the cabin's fences. Floating, the mask carrying and using Dale's body like a puppet, hands outstretched to get me and my baby. I didn't stop running until I reached the nearest village and told the first person I saw everything. I didn't care if they thought I was crazy. My husband was just possessed by a weird mask thing, and for all I could tell, it tried to eat my baby. The villagers told me the mask was most likely possessed by a leek, a baby-eating deity that it portrayed and is known to inhabit its visual portrayals. 
They managed to catch Dale and perform some rituals that helped me get my husband back. Uh, needless to say, the very next morning, we took the first flight back home. My name is Rebecca, and I'm 18 years old. I'm trying to save up money for college, so I've been babysitting for some family friends. I love kids, so it's a pretty fun gig. One day, my next door neighbor Linda asked me if I was free to watch her son Matthew on the weekend. I didn't know Linda too well, but she always seemed nice. I assumed she was kind of a helicopter parent. I'd often see her playing with Matthew in their front yard, and she seemed to really baby him. Some mothers are kind of like that. I didn't have any plans for the weekend, so I told her I'd be happy to. She told me to come over that Saturday at 6. When I got there, she gave me a printed out list of rules for the house. It included a list of at least a dozen foods that Matthew was supposedly allergic to, plus a bunch of ridiculous directions for how to take care of her son. No TV, no music, no loud voices. It felt like she was a prison warden or something. Once I read the directions, she made me sign the bottom of the paper to make sure that I agreed. I never had another babysitting job like this. I was already starting to regret signing up for it. Linda gave her son an awkwardly long goodbye hug, and then she left. As soon as she drove off, little Matthew breathed a big sigh of relief. I could tell that he was afraid to be himself when his mom was around. Now that it was just the two of us, he started acting like more of a little kid. We played with Legos, and then I took him outside to throw a baseball. He wasn't very good, and he fell a lot, but it was fun. We did that for about an hour, and then I tucked him in and caught up on my homework before his mom came back home. When she got back, she started grilling me on exactly what I did with her son. I told her everything, and then she paid me and let me leave. I thought things went pretty well, but the next morning, Linda called me. She was furious. I had no idea what happened, but she was screaming at me and threatening to destroy me. I told her to slow down and explain the problem but that just made her angrier. She said something like, you know what you did, and then she hung up. This happened at seven in the morning on a Sunday, so I just went back to sleep. I woke up a few minutes later, and right away, I saw that Linda was standing outside my window looking in. As soon as we locked eyes, she ducked down so I couldn't see her. I really didn't understand what her problem was, so I opened the door and said, hey, what the hell are you doing? She was still acting like I'd done something horrible last night. She pulled out her phone and showed me at least a dozen photos of the same thing. Matthew's knee. Apparently, he'd scraped it a little while we were outside. Neither of us noticed it at the time, and all the pictures showed was a single red scratch. That's it? I asked. You hurt my baby! She screamed. She shouted a bunch of other stuff too. She was so loud that my parents woke up and ran into the room. I explained to them what Linda's problem was, and they seemed just as annoyed as I was. My dad politely asked her to get out of our yard. She left, but not before screaming, this isn't over. My parents and I had a good laugh after that, but I was still pretty weirded out by the whole thing. I know that moms can get protective sometimes, but this was ridiculous. For the next week, I saw Linda a couple times on our street, and every time she glared as if she wanted to murder me. I always waved politely, but that didn't help things. The next Saturday, I was hanging out at my house watching TV. My friend Trina was going to come over later, but for now, I was alone. I would just gotten up to heat some popcorn when I heard someone outside my front door. I thought it was Trina, so I went over and opened it. It was not Trina. Linda was standing on my front porch, smiling darkly. She had a rope in one hand and some sort of paper in the other. What are you doing here? I asked. She pushed me to the side and charged into the house. Before I could even react, she grabbed my hair and threw me to the ground. Then in seconds, she tied up my hands. What are you doing? I said again. You hurt my baby. She told me, I want to teach you how it feels. She sat on my feet so I couldn't move. I tried to wriggle out from under her, but I couldn't. I could see that the paper in her hand was some sort of sandpaper that construction workers would use. Laughing wildly, she pressed the sandpaper against my knee. I couldn't believe it. Her son had gotten a minor scratch on his knee, and in retaliation, this psycho was going to scratch me with sandpaper. Let's see how long it takes for me to get to the bone, she said. She started rubbing the sandpaper against my skin. 
At first, it only felt like tiny prickles of pain, but I knew that it wouldn't take long before she drew blood. Please, I begged, get off me. She got really close to my face and whispered, not until we're even. She started to scratch me again when I heard a knock at the door. Trina was here. I screamed for her to come in, but when the door opened, it wasn't Trina. It was Matthew. He had two policemen with him. Mom? He said. The policeman pulled Linda off me and led her out of the house. Matthew came over and said, I'm so sorry. I knew my mom was going to do something crazy, so I called 911. You did a good thing, I said. After that, Linda was taken to jail for assault. She lost custody of her son, and he ended up moving in with his dad in another state. My leg healed up pretty quickly, and I went back to babysitting. But from then on, I made sure to reject any offers that gave me a bad feeling. I didn't want to live through something like that again. I was alone in my office for the entire weekend while my co-workers were at some team-building retreat up in the mountains. It was mandatory for the entire staff to go, including me, but I convinced my boss to let me stay behind and catch up on our quarterly reports. I would much rather stare at my computer all day than do a bunch of trust activities with a group of co-workers who didn't even like me. I'm a total introvert, but sometimes that comes across as rude. My boss, Stan, seemed honestly relieved when I told him that I would stay behind. It was the middle of the day and I was filling out spreadsheets on my computer. I had been in it for hours and I really needed a break. I left my desk and started walking around the office just to stretch my legs. I thought about my co-workers, who were probably in the middle of some dumb game up in the mountains. The whole office was really quiet until a notification beep came from my computer. It was the sound I got whenever someone sent a personal message using the office's internal systems. We use those kinds of messages for work-related issues, and they could only be accessed from inside the building. The only way I'd get a message like that is if someone else was in the building with me. That thought made the hairs on the back of my neck stand. Our building was split into two floors, and since I didn't see anyone when I came in, that must mean that someone was using one of the computers upstairs. I ran over to my computer and clicked on the message box at the bottom of the screen. It said the message was sent from Stan, my boss. But it couldn't be him, because he was off in the mountains. But at least I knew which computer it was sent from. The message said, Get out of the building. Chills ran down my spine. Who would send something like this? I typed in my reply. Who are you? A response came immediately. A friend. I wrote back. Why do you want me to get out of the building? It took a little longer in response to come in this time. It said in all caps. GET OUT NOW. That response told me everything. Someone was upstairs doing something illegal, probably stealing money or documents. They came here today because they knew that everyone would be gone from the office. Whoever this person was, they must have realized that I was still here and used the messages to get me to leave. I'd worked for this company for two years, and even though I mostly stuck to myself, I had always been proud of the work I'd done. I felt loyal to the company, and I didn't want this creep to get away with whatever he was doing. So against my own common sense, I decided to walk upstairs and confront him myself. As soon as I reached the second floor, I started to have second thoughts. I should have contacted the police before I came up here, but it was too late now. I had to be quiet until I reached Stan's office door. All the windows were drawn and the lights were out, but I could see the blue glow from Stan's computer. I walked toward the door, expecting to hear someone rifling through papers on the other side, but I didn't. Everything was deathly quiet. I took a deep breath and then pushed the door open. I don't know what I expected to see, but 
I definitely didn't expect an empty office. No one was in here, and the blue glow from the computer was because of its screensaver. I double-checked that the room was empty, and then I clicked on the computer mouse. I didn't need to type in a password. Instantly, I saw the blueprints of the building pop up on screen. I opened his messenger and saw that the strange messages hadn't come from him after all. His most recent messages were from the night before, between him and his business partner, Steve. I was about to forget about this whole thing and go back downstairs when I noticed something strange about the messages between them. Stan is usually very direct, but these messages seemed to be some sort of code. They were actually about some kind of plan for today. He used phrases like the event and when it happened without actually explaining what they were planning to do. Then I noticed my name in the chat. What about Gloria? Steve asked. And Stan's reply, collateral damage. I had no idea what was going on, but it didn't sound good. I snapped a photo of the computer screen and left the room, grabbed my purse, and walked right out of the building. I still had a lot of work to do, but I couldn't concentrate. I was too freaked out by the strange messages and too offended by Stan's comment. Exactly at noon, I got in my car. I was about to drive off. Right in front of me, the building exploded. Pieces of the walls flew through the air. One big chunk of the building crashed down onto the hood of my car. I didn't get hurt, thank God. I stepped out of my car and started walking home. I was in shock, I think. I didn't tell anyone what happened. I walked for 20 minutes before I made it home and collapsed on my couch. I was completely numb all over. Less than an hour later, my phone started buzzing with messages and missed calls. I turned on the news and saw a reporter standing in front of the rubble that had once been my office. He said that a gas leak had caused the explosion. He mentioned one casualty, me. I watched in shock as the footage then cut to my boss, Stan, sobbing into the camera. He was still up in the mountains. I don't care about the building. Our insurance will cover everything, but I'm heartbroken about Gloria. She was one of our greatest employees. If only she had come on the retreat with us. My other co-workers stood behind him, looking solemn. I knew my boss well enough to tell when he was lying. He wasn't upset. He knew this was going to happen. He planned it. That's why I saw the building blueprints on his computer. I guess I got over my shock because I called 911 and told them that I was still alive. They sent an officer over and I explained what happened. I told them that the explosion must have been arson. Whether it was for money or something else, Stan had planned to blow up his own building, and he didn't care that I had been inside. The cop didn't believe me until I showed him the photo I took of Stan's computer. They arrested him right after that. I can't believe how close I was to dying. It was a miracle I made it out in time. What I don't understand is who had sent me those messages in the first place. All the computers are destroyed, so there's no way of knowing who really sent them. I guess I'll never know. My name is James. I used to teach English abroad before I got a good job in the States. Last winter, I had some time off and decided to go back to Kazakhstan where I used to work. I wanted to visit some of my old friends and enjoy a snowy December. My ex-coworker Bradley asked me to stay with him in his apartment. I was surprised by the offer. We used to be friends, but we didn't leave on good terms. I had hooked up with his ex-girlfriend at the time, and he got really mad at me. I thought that I'd ruin our relationship forever, but I guess he'd gotten over it. So I flew to Kazakhstan in the beginning of December. My first week there, 
I caught up with all my old friends. I went ice skating and shopping. I did karaoke. It was really fun. And honestly, Bradley was a great host. He always cooked for me, and when we went somewhere, he never let me pay. That weekend, Bradley invited me to go hiking in the mountains just outside the city. I'm not a big hiker, but he was pretty insistent. Besides, if I was in Kazakhstan, I might as well enjoy the mountains. I made sure to wear as many layers as possible. Bradley and I left early in the morning while it was still extremely cold. Right away, I realized that something was off about the trip. Bradley kept insisting that we go off the marked path. He said there was a frozen lake that he wanted to show me. He insisted that he knew the way, but I really didn't feel comfortable cutting through such thick, snowy forest. Before I knew it, we were pretty deep in the wilderness and I had no idea how to get back to the road. Bradley kept walking though. He knew exactly where he was taking me. At least he acted like he did. The further we got, the colder I became. I enjoyed it at first, but after a while, I was shivering and miserable. At the beginning of our trip, we passed a lot of other hikers. But as soon as we went off the trail, we didn't see anyone for over an hour. I also noticed that Bradley kept glancing at me and then smirking to himself. He looked pretty devious. Where was he taking me? Eventually, I told Bradley that I'd had enough. I wanted to turn back. He shrugged and said, okay. It was like he didn't care about the frozen lake anymore. He said he needed to take a piss and then we could leave. He walked into the woods and I stood there waiting for him to return. He never did. I waited for five long minutes before I realized he wasn't coming back. This was his plan all along. He wanted to leave me there, lost and alone. This was his big revenge plan. Angry and a little scared, I followed his footprints through the snow, but then I lost them. He must have covered up his tracks so I couldn't follow. I fished out my phone to call for help, but nothing happened. There was no reception. That was when panic started to set in. I could either climb to the top of the mountain and try to see where the path was, or I could start walking down the mountain and hope that I find someone. I didn't have the energy to continue going up, so I started my long walk down the mountain. For the next hour, I kept walking. My feet kept sinking into the thick snow and my whole body ached from the cold. I tried to find any sign of Bradley, but I couldn't. Eventually, I started screaming for help. No one could hear me. I don't remember how long I was out there, but it felt like forever. Finally, I reached a familiar creek. I knew I was going the right way. I followed the frozen stream all the way back to the main road. I waited there, barely able to move, until a car came passing by. They weren't going to stop, so I literally had to stand in the middle of the road and force them to let me in. I was so cold, I could barely speak. The driver didn't speak much English, so I really struggled to explain that my friend had abandoned me on the mountain. I don't think he truly understood me, but it didn't matter. He drove me back to the city, and I had him drop me off at Bradley's apartment. I didn't know where else to go. And besides, I needed to finally confront him face to face. I used my spare key and let myself in. I was ready to scream at him. He could have killed me. But when I got inside, I could hear him talking to someone on his phone. He was just explaining what he'd done, really laughing about it. What an idiot, Bradley said. I can't believe he followed me all that way. I'm just waiting for him to come back now. He should be here any minutes, I think. Serves him right for stealing my girlfriend. Hearing him gloat like that made me even angrier. I couldn't let him get away with this. So, instead of approaching him, I quietly left the apartments and went downstairs to the lobby. Then I called him on my phone and pretended that my connection was bad. He answered right away. Bradley, you have to help me! I screamed into the phone. Where are you? He asked in a fake worried voice. I pretended to sound terrified, forcing my voice to tremble. I I'm still where you left me. My leg's broken. What? He asked. He sounded genuinely concerned, so I knew that my prank was working. I, I fell into a ravine when I was looking for you. I lied, trying to sound as pitiful as possible. I'm going to die unless you find me. Damn it, James, he said. 
You were supposed to find your own way back. I couldn't, Bradley. I'm not as smart as you. And now I'm trapped here. I'm so cold. I can't feel anything. He took a deep breath and then said he was going to call the police to come get me. At that point, I felt like my joke had gone too far. I didn't want to get the police involved in a search for someone who isn't really missing. So I said, You really do that? You tell the police that you left me alone on the mountain? He stopped to think. As I expected, he didn't want to get the police involved either. I knew Bradley well enough to know that he wouldn't do anything to make himself look bad. Eventually, he told me to stay where I was. He'd come get me himself. I can't move, Bradley. Please, hurry. I said, I'm coming. He shouted into the phone. Then, he ended the call. I waited in the lobby for him to rush out. As soon as he would walk out of the elevator, I'd surprise him and tell him that I knew what he did. It would be hilarious, and he'd finally learn not to mess with me. I pictured the look of relief on his face, but he never came out. He lied to me on the phone. He was actually going to let me die in the mountains. After 10 minutes of waiting, I took the elevator up to his apartment. I had no idea what I was going to say to him. When I got back inside, his apartment was empty. I looked all around until I found him smoking on the balcony. At least he seemed guilty. His hands were shaking and he was in deep thought. I quietly walked up to him and shouted, Hey! I'd never seen someone look so scared in my life. He jerked backward and started mumbling. You, you're dead. I knew I looked terrible after trekking through the snow for so long, but I didn't think I looked like a ghost. Why did you leave me up there? I asked him. He just kept mumbling. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Then he slipped on some of the ice on the balcony. He fell backwards over the railing. It happened so fast I couldn't stop him. One second he was there, and the next, he was gone. He fell 12 stories to his death. I'm not sure whether he actually thought that I was a ghost out for revenge, or whether it was just a tragic accident. Either way, he was gone. I should have felt guilty over what happened, but deep down, I knew he deserved it. I flew out of Kazakhstan the next day, and I don't think I'll be back. I'm done with cold weather. My husband Trevor and I live in a pretty nice neighborhood on the edge of a national park. We had a great view of the forest, and our neighbors were all super rich. Neither of us made much money at work, but Trevor had inherited a lot of money after the death of his first wife, so we had a lot in the bank account. Even though our neighborhood was pretty well off, someone kept stealing our packages on the porch. Trevor ordered a lot of stuff online, and if we weren't home when his packages arrived, they always seemed to disappear. We asked our neighbors about it, and no one had the same problem. After an expensive video game system went missing, Trevor decided to install a ring camera. It was connected to Trevor's laptop, so if anything triggered the motion sensors, we'd be able to see a live stream on our porch from his computer. After we installed it, we left out a decoy package on our porch and waited to catch the thief in the act. We left the package out all day, and no one took it. Then, when it was already dark, Trevor got an alert from the motion sensor that someone was right outside our front door. Trevor looked on his laptop and gasped. His whole face went pale. I tried to look over his shoulder, but he wouldn't let me look. He told me that it was just an animal, but I knew from his reaction that it was definitely more serious than that. He jumped out of bed and said he'd shoo away the animal. He told me to stay there and then ran to the front door. I waited for several minutes, but he didn't come back. I started to get worried, so I walked to the front door and saw that Trevor had left it open. I walked outside, but didn't see Trevor or anyone else nearby. The package was still there. I called out for Trevor's name, but no one answered. That's when I got really scared. 
What if Trevor had tried to confront the burglar? What if he'd been kidnapped or something? I ran back inside and locked the door behind me. I grabbed my phone to call the police, but then I stopped. I needed to see the ring camera footage first. That way, I could tell the police exactly what happened. I went back into our room and opened Trevor's laptop. He never gave me his password, but I knew it anyway. I logged into the Ring camera app and scrolled back a few minutes to watch the footage. What I saw next made absolutely no sense. The video showed a woman in a torn white dress with long, scraggly hair covering her face. She was real thin and filthy. She walked onto our porch, looked around, and then grabbed the package. Then. I saw Trevor race out and start talking to her. The audio was a bit garbled, but I could hear Trevor asking the woman what she was doing here. It sounded like they knew each other. She muttered something, but her voice was too quiet for me to hear. Trevor told her to drop the package and leave. I watched as she slowly put the package back on the porch and just stood there staring at my husband. She didn't move for a long time, until she rushed towards Trevor and grabbed him by the shoulders. His back was to the camera, so I couldn't see exactly what she was doing to him, but it looked like she bit him in the face. He screamed and fell onto the ground. The woman grabbed a stick and slammed it into the back of his head. Then. She dragged him down the porch steps and out of the camera's view. Absolutely horrified, I dialed 911 and told them that my husband was kidnapped. I know I should have waited for the police to arrive. The woman on the phone said they'd be there in less than five minutes, but I couldn't just sit in my house. I had to track them down. I ran out of the house and looked on either side of the street. It was completely empty. I noticed drag marks in the dirt and realized that the woman had pulled my husband across the yard and into the wooded area behind our house. I picked up a tree branch from the ground and followed the trail until I reached the tree line. It was too dark to see anything, especially when I walked a few steps into the woods. I tried to listen for any noise, but the whole area was completely silent. Pretty soon I got too scared to keep going. The police were almost there, and even though my husband was in danger, I knew that the smart thing to do was to go back to the street. But right as I turned around, I heard that woman's whispered voice. I waited for you. Why didn't you come for me? She wasn't talking to me, though. She was talking to my husband. I heard him moan in response but the hit to his head must have really messed him up because he could barely say anything. I wasn't just gonna leave him there. I kept walking through the darkness, following the woman's voice until I reached a clearing in the trees. Moonlight shined through the open space and I could only make out a small camp where the woman must have been staying. There was a tent, a pile of cooking supplies, and a bunch of empty Amazon boxes. She must have been here for a while, living off all the packages that she'd been stealing from us. I saw the woman crouch low to the ground. Trevor was lying on the ground in front of her. Neither of them saw me as I walked closer, and I tried not to make a sound. I stopped a few feet behind her, raising my stick so I could knock her out and take Trevor to safety. I could see that Trevor was barely conscious. One of his eyes was swollen shut and blood dripped from his nose. Ah, you said you'd come back to me, the crazy woman told him. I was about to slam the stick into the back of her head when Trevor muttered, I'm so sorry, Helen. Helen was his first wife, the one who died, the one whose inheritance paid for everything we owned. It didn't seem possible. Was this really Helen? Still alive and camped out beside our house? 
Did Trevor know about her all this time? Confused and scared, I slammed the stick into the back of Helen's head and she collapsed onto the ground. I reached for Trevor and tried to pull him to his feet, but he wouldn't move. He was passed out. Just then I heard the noise behind me. Two police officers ran towards us. One checked on Trevor while the other asked me what happened. I tried to tell them what I knew, but it was all so strange. By the time the ambulance came for Trevor, he was already dead from his injuries. Helen was gone. She ran deeper into the woods when no one was looking. To this day, I have no idea why Helen would fake her own death and hide out in the woods behind our house. Any information that Trevor could give me was gone forever, and I don't think anyone will ever find Helen again. I moved out of that house and tried to restart my life without my husband. Every night I still have nightmares of that woman coming back to find me. My husband Richard bought stuff on Amazon a lot. Mostly sports memorabilia and presents for me and his family. Every few days there was always a new box or two on our doorstep. Usually, Richard seemed fine if I opened the boxes before he got home from work. We didn't keep any secrets between each other. One day, though, Richard told me that he had a very special box coming in that afternoon. He didn't want me to look at it or even touch it. I assumed it was a present for our upcoming anniversary, so I promised him that I wouldn't. When the box came, I saw that it was about as big as a microwave. I remembered what Richard said, so I left it sitting on the doorstep. Usually, Richard came home exactly at 5.30, but that day, he sent me a text at 5.15 saying that he had a lot of work to do and was going to spend the night in the office. He'd never done that before. He was the manager of his own company, so he made a lot of money. But whenever problems came up at work, he'd always have his employees deal with it. Worse than that, his message didn't include his usual emojis. I texted him back asking if everything was okay, and he sent me a one-word response. Fine. Then, I texted him that I was going to bring his package inside. He instantly messaged me back in all capital letters. Do not touch it. I really wanted to know what was going on, but I forced myself to think about other things. Richard and I have been together for eight years, and I trusted him. I stayed inside all evening, watching TV. I went to bed pretty early, but I could not go to sleep. I kept thinking about Richard. Around 10, I was lying awake in bed when I saw our porch lights turn on through the window. At first, I thought that Richard had finally come home, but then I realized that he would have entered through the garage, not our front door. The lights were motion activated, so someone other than my husband was outside. I jumped out of bed and ran to the living room. Through the window, I could see the silhouette of a tall, thin man crouched on our porch, who was leaning over the package trying to open it. I know I should have called the police, but I wasn't thinking straight. Instead, I threw the front door wide open and screamed out, Hey! Who are you? The man turned toward me. He was wearing a ski mask so I couldn't see his face. He had the half-open box in his arms. Immediately, he spun around and started running toward the street. I chased after him. The man was a good foot taller than me, and I should have been scared, but I really wasn't. Richard worked very hard to provide for us, and I wouldn't let anyone try to steal his things. He raced past our gates and onto the sidewalk, but I tackled him to the ground before he could get any further. He didn't even try to fight me. He just lied on the ground while I pried the package out of his hands. I was about to run back inside and call the police when he screamed, Wait! Why? I asked. Who are you? He pulled off his mask, revealing a familiar face. I didn't know who he was, but I recognized him from somewhere. I assumed he was one of Richard's employees. I'm just trying to stop him. He said. Who? Richard? He's going to kill us all, the man said. Please, let me explain. Fine, I muttered. Still lying on the ground, the man said his name was Thomas. He was Richard's accountant. 
He said that he discovered my husband planning to blow up their office building. He tried to tell people, but no one would believe him. So he had to take matters into his own hands. I asked him what that had to do with our Amazon package, and he just told me to look in the box. The cardboard was already ripped open. I peered inside and saw a bunch of metal pieces and technical stuff. I couldn't tell what it was. It's the material to make a bomb, Thomas explained. He said that Richard's company was deeply in debt, and rather than file for bankruptcy, my husband planned to blow up the whole building, blame it on someone else, and then cash in on their insurance policy. It didn't matter if some of his employees were in the building at that time. I couldn't believe that. My husband would never do something so terrible. There had to be another explanation. But Thomas looked deadly serious. Slowly, he got to his feet. He begged me to give him the box so he could destroy it. Do you know where my husband is right now? I asked. Thomas looked away. I shoved him hard, trying to force an answer out of him. He couldn't look me in the eyes, but he admitted that he tied up Richard and left him in his office. He was going to take the bomb material straight to the police. I didn't know what to do. Deep down, I believed him, even though his story was unbelievable. I realized that the only way to find out was to go to Richard myself. With the package still in my arms, I left him behind and ran to my car. Pretty soon, I'd driven all the way to Richard's office. No one was in the lobby. I used my key to let myself in, and then took the elevator up to Richard's office. When I opened the door, I saw him tied to his chair. Sweat streamed down his face. Thank God you're here, he said. He looked relieved to see me, until he noticed the open package in my arms. He started breathing really heavy and said, Please, untie me, then I'll explain everything. On his desk was the layout of his building, including a little red X where he was planning to put the bomb. That was when I knew that everything Thomas had said was true. I was horrified. I started to leave, and Richard screamed at me to stop. I was going to do this for us, he said. All the money we were going to make, it was for us. I left him tied up and went straight to the police station. When I got there, Thomas was already sitting with one of the policemen who didn't look like he believed Thomas at all. I dumped the box of equipment on their table and said, Everything he just told you is true. As I explained everything, the cop took a bunch of notes and then he sent three of his officers to find my husband in his office. I finally thanked Thomas for what he did, even if he went about it the wrong way. Who knows how many lives he'd saved, just because he tried to steal that package off my doorstep.